Dave Morley just started supporting independent tech news today. Want to be like Dave? Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 2nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And uh, somewhere from L.A. County, I am Roger Chang, the show's producer. Patrick Beja out sick today. Wish him a speedy recovery. He'll be back next week, and we'll be talking about some gaming trends with him. But let's start today's show with a few tech things you should know. Samsung announced a new product launch on August 7th in New York, likely to be the Galaxy Note 10. A recent rumor about the Note 10 said that the S Pen might have a camera of its own. And another rumor said that the Note 10 could have four rear cameras. Mm. Sony announced it is raising the price of all the tiers of its PlayStation View streaming TV service by $5 a month. They did the same thing last year. Current subscribers will start paying the higher price after July 31st. Apple CEO Tim Cook disputed a report about the departure of design chief Johnny Ive, saying that Ive had grown frustrated with Cook's leadership and the report does not match reality and fails to understand how Apple's design team actually works. Ive was responsible for the design of many Apple products, including the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, and the Apple Watch. You could tell he was angry uh, because he lost his accent. NVIDIA has refreshed its RTX line, the RTX 2060 Super and the RTX 2070 Super, available on July 9th for the same price as the previous version, $399 and $499, respectively. On July 23rd, the $699 RTX 2080 Super will be available, and NVIDIA will continue selling the RTX 2080 Ti for $999, and the RTX 2060, which will be marked down to $349. The 2070 and 2080 graphics cards are being phased out by NVIDIA. All right, we've got a couple of Interesting announcements from Microsoft today. Sarah, tell us about them. Yeah, we do. Microsoft released a few details about the September update of Windows 10, aka 19H2. The update will include performance improvements, enterprise features, and quality enhancements. It'll also be delivered in a monthly update, making it faster and less disruptive, you know, if it works that way. So a small service pack like update is coming in September. However, Microsoft also tweeted a video announcing Windows 1.0 with MS-DOS executive clock and more. Best guess, Microsoft will release 1.0, Windows 1.0, as an open source as it has for MS-DOS and calculator as well. Yeah. So the Windows 10 thing is, is fairly innocuous. It's going to be a small update, uh, it's going to be delivered like monthly updates, which means it'll it'll be a lot easier uh, to handle. Uh, and likely that's because it's small. I, I imagine that the spring update next year will probably have a lot more features in it. Uh, this is this is an interesting aspect of the continuing update of Windows that you will get these occasional service pack like updates whenever they're necessary. Whenever Microsoft says, you know what, we're holding off some features till we get them right. Those will be next time. I like this. The Windows 1.0 announcement is just odd. Uh, well, and, and and as we were, you know, preparing for this, it confused me. I was like, 1.0 or 10? Like, what are we no, talking right, about? Yeah, Roger and Sarah both like, <laughs> you misspelled Windows 10. I was like, no, read, read, read what I, like, I, the, I, I know I would do that. that. That is like me. But this time I didn't, I, I swear. They, they really meant Windows 1.0. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, what, you know, what are you most excited about? I'm more, ex I'll, I'll be, I'm boring. I'm more excited about a very stable, small and fast Windows 10 update than yeah. I am about Windows 1.0 uh, going open source. I, I have a working copy of Windows 286 uh, sitting on a, you can't see it, uh, on an IBM PS2 3286 over there in the closet. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's for nostalgia purposes. I guess it's kind of cool if they make it available open source. I just, I, it's weird that they would put that out as a big tease. They had a video where it went from the Windows 10 logo backwards through all the Windows logos until they got to the Windows 1.0 logo. I guess the big takeaway for me is that Windows 1.0 logo was was pretty good. Like yeah. you, that could be a modern logo. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as 80s as some of the things are. I, I think they're, you know what? 80s nostalgia is huge right now. We got a new season of Stranger Things coming. If they're going to release it open source, they're trying to play on that 80s nostalgia that's hot right now, I think. No? Yeah? Maybe. I mean, yeah, you're probably right. 
<laughs> In an interview Friday, GameSpot asked Google VP Phil Harrison what impact ISP data caps would have on Google's Stadia game streaming product. Here's what Harrison said. The ISPs have a strong history of staying ahead of consumer trends. And if you look at the history of data caps in those small number of markets, and it's actually a relatively small number of markets that have data caps, the trend over time when music streaming and downloading become popular, especially in the early days when it was not necessarily legitimate, data caps moved up. Then with the evolution of TV and film streaming, data caps moved up. And we expect that will continue to be the case. Now, Ars Technica points out, Comcast raised its monthly data cap from 300 gigabytes to a terabyte in 2016 and now charges overage fees rather than just having a hard cap. Uh, Comcast imposes caps and charges in parts of 27 of the 39 states that it offers its service. So Ars Technica is saying that doesn't sound like a rare, a relatively small number of markets, but of course they're just talking about Comcast there. Uh, AT&T uh, also has data caps, so that's a large number of markets as well. They range from 150 gigabytes to a terabyte. Charter doesn't have any data caps, but Charter is prohibited from using data caps until 2023 as a condition of its merger with Time Warner. So Ars Technica is trying to say, look, this isn't as simple as Harrison makes it sound. But having been through this a couple of times where people were saying, like I particularly remember folks saying, Netflix will never catch on as a streaming product because of data caps. And what happened was either data caps didn't exist or they were raised so that Netflix streaming did work. Now, if you're in a place with 150 gigabyte data cap, you're still saying Netflix streaming doesn't work for me. Uh, and I understand that, but it hasn't killed Netflix, obviously. I, As much as you can pick at what Harrison said as being maybe over-optimistic, I kind of feel like in general, he's not wrong that if Stadia doesn't work, it won't be because of data caps. I also wonder, okay, so charter being prohibited based on, you know, a, 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 uh, something that th they had gone into agreement with, with another company, prohibited from having data caps. Why isn't there more outrage from you and me to say no one should ever have data caps? Oh, there's plenty of outrage from you and me and other people about data well, caps. Right? But out outrage that that changes the 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 landscape? Not and really. You know what? Ars Technica has a really good point uh, here. You know, I keep saying Ars Technica. I should really give credit to the actual author uh, of this study uh, because uh, John Brodkin does the Lord's work when he's covering this stuff. Uh, and he does a really good job of pointing out that where there aren't data caps, you can generally find competition either Verizon Fios or Frontier, or maybe AT&T has, has its fiber service. Where there are data caps, usually it's because the pers the company doing data caps actually just doesn't have any competition, so they can, they can get away with it. But even then, those data caps do tend to get raised based on usage. Where the data caps are low, a lot of times it's because usage is not very high. And if you're the one person who wants to do a lot of usage in your area that runs into that, that doesn't help you. But yeah. I think there's less outrage because you and I don't have data caps, right? We don't run into it that often. You know, though, I mean, I I always uh, sing the praises of Plex, a uh, media server that I use. Um, my, my, I, I, uh, it's uh, Time Warner, uh, cable well, that spectrum i now yeah spectrum yeah. now yes um and every so often you know there's some sort of a blip where i realize like there's a data cap going on i know well, what's going on there's a difference between that and a data cap a data cap is you hit your limit and we're going to charge you more all right that's 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 specific what you're well, talking it's about throttling. is you're, what you're talking about is the service outage, which probably isn't throttling. It's probably just mm. because the way cable works, if a lot of people use a node at once, it gives bad service to everybody. Perhaps. I don't know. Mm. We'll, we'll oh. agree to disagree on this. All right. The U U.S. state of Virginia has amended an existing law that defines distribution of nudes or sexual imagery without consent as a class one misdemeanor to specifically include, quote, falsely created videographic or still images. The bill was signed into law in March and took effect on July 1st. New York has a similar bill that received opposition from Disney and others for being too broad. U.S. Representative Yvette Clark introduced a bill into the U.S. House to make deep fakes made with the intent to humiliate or harass a federal crime. 
Yeah, so we're getting more laws on this. Virginia's is being touted as the first time that deep fakes have been specifically targeted. It's yeah. not named. It's you know videographic or still image, but uh, but it is technolo technologically focused. Uh, and I, I think you could say, well, they already had distribution illegal. Wouldn't that cover it? But then you have to go to court and prove that you're example is what the law intended. And there could be room for the defense to argue that it wasn't for this or that reason. Adding the specificity uh, with that by amending the law, not passing a whole new law, uh, is a good way to say this, let's, let's remove the doubt. These kinds of distribution of images are included, you know, so no, let's not have any worry about that. Yeah, I, I mean, tough, tough subject. Um, mm. it, uh, and I, I would say the, the more that we can, uh, I don't know, uh, create, uh, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, why is this bad? And how is this bad? Um, uh, I, I don't always feel that way about uh, laws in general, but in this case, I feel like we're on the right track. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of debate about whether uh, distributing a picture of someone else uh, naked that they did not agree to is wrong. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not seeing a lot of other side to that argument. Sure. Yeah. It's unfortunate that we were in the situation where we're like, hey, we got to make some laws about this stuff. But here we yeah. are. Well, the deep fakes is interesting because that's not, oh, I took a picture or someone shared a picture and now I'm distributing it without their permission. It's it's they they never had a naked picture of them. Right. If the, you're just taking someone's head and convincingly putting it on someone else's body, that's now specifically illegal with this, which is good. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Australia's NBN company, which runs the National Fiber Network there, has a proposal out before the top 50 retail ISPs or RSPs, because uh, they're retail service providers, not providing the infrastructure, uh, asking the following. Would your organization support the development of a price response whereby charging of streaming video could be differentiated from the charging of other traffic slash services. Would your organization be likely to productize such a mechanism if developed by NBN? Uh, ooh, I love a good jargon sentence. What they're asking is, hey, if we did some deep packet inspection and could tell uh, what traffic was video streaming and what wasn't, and then we charged you extra for the video stream, would you be cool with that by passing along the cost to your customers? Just wondering, asking for a friend, because uh, we'd like to make that money. <laughs> this would likely take the form of some kind of deep packet inspection and could possibly be a virtual connection or a CVC separating the video traffic from the other traffic. But uh, most of the RSPs are responding, at least the ones who are talking on the record with IT News, uh, by saying, no, that's a horrible idea. Do not do this. We understand you want to make more money. Uh, but our job is not to deep packet inspect our customers' data. It's to deliver the data they asked. And the NBN certainly shouldn't be looking at what the packets of data are because they are simply supposed to be operating the pipe. Okay. Um, do you think that uh, the outrage from the ISPs is more about the fact that they're like, mm, this is going to cost us more? No, because if it was that, they'd just pass it along, right? They'd just yeah. say like, eh, well, we can just charge people more. I, I think there are probably some RSPs out there who would say like, oh yeah, no, a chance to make more money. Good, we'll do it. But because you have 50 retail RSPs or retail ISPs in Australia, you have enough competition that they know that if uh, everybody doesn't do it, then their customers will leave for the ISPs that don't do it. So there are some out there that are like the Sonic Net here in the United States that say, no, we, we want to be customer friendly. That's how we keep our customers. And this is not a customer friendly uh, situation. So hopefully they, they, tell the NBN with a, a fairly convincing voice, no, don't do this. It's a bad idea. <sighs> Moving on, The Guardian, The New York Times, Motherboard, and other publications have all had stories out claiming Chinese border guards in the Xinjiang region have been installing spyware on tourist phones. Where is the Xinjiang region? Well, borders India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, 
and Mongolia. Border agents ask for phones uh, and passcodes and plug them into a machine that then scans contents. If it's an Android phone and it installs an app called BZAQ or Feng K that collects and transmits contacts, text messages, call history, calendar entries, installed apps, and usernames used in some apps. The app is meant to be deleted after inspection, but isn't always. Yeah. And it was uh, somebody who had a phone where the app was left on it that contacted several of these news outlets to show them the app and talk to them about it. Uh, that source crossed the border at Kyrgyzstan, which would make sense. Uh, there's a lot of surveillance, particularly of the Uyghur population uh, and Muslim populations in that area of China. Uh, and it would be most likely they would be crossing from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, possibly parts of India, but the Muslim parts of India, Kashmir uh, are around there too. So, um, but, but yeah, this is, uh, I don't know what you do about this though, right? Yeah. It's China. So I think public pressure not to install these doesn't do anything. It doesn't change the Chinese government's take on this. Uh, it's in an area of the country where public pressure is seen as a threat anyway. So it's, you know, it's not even going to be allowed to get started. I think probably what happens is a bunch of these border agents get chastised for forgetting to take the app off. Yeah. And, you know, based on what we know of what's being collected, most of us would be like, eh, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing. You, you don't want anything that's in my, you know, my my call history, my calendar entries, that sort of thing. But the fact that it's possible is frightening. Um, and certainly, you know, if you're if you're moving in, I don't know, uh, across the border of any of these regions, it's something you know that you have to know about. Yeah, because we we have the same issue in in the United States where Customs yeah. Border Patrol has uh, taken people's phones into another room. Uh, there's no evidence that they actually installed an app uh, to copy things, but there's no evidence that they didn't. It's just one way or the other. We don't know. Uh, at least I don't know of any situations where there is clear evidence that that happened. But people have been objecting to that practice, at least for U.S. citizens, uh, and saying, no, you shouldn't be able to do that. And there are now changing laws being developed for, for Customs and Border Patrol here uh, in those situations for technology and such. Um, I, I doubt that anything changes in China, though. Yeah. At least as far as this goes. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Muse with us now, ladies and gentlemen, on the words of Samsung executives about where we will be in five years. You see this cell phone in my hand? Won't be using that, apparently. Samsung CEO DJ Ko uh, told the media in a briefing, the previous 10 years was an era of the smartphone. From this year, maybe a new era is opening because of the emergence of the Internet of Things, 5G, AI, and all these technologies mingling together. The new era is in front of us. We must think rather than smartphones, we must think smart devices. So he's saying everything's centered on the smartphone right now, and that's where we've been for 10 years, but it's about to change. It's about to diversify into lots of different devices. And I think that's something we could all wrap our heads around and say, yeah, it's about time for Internet of Things to grow up, 5G, because of its capacity, not necessarily because of the speed, but because of the amount of capacity 5G can handle, uh, and Wi-Fi 6 as well, uh, we're going to see uh, a lot more capability in our Internet of Things devices, hopefully increased security along with that. But Samsung design head Kang Yun Ji said the reason for building a foldable phone at Samsung, remember the Galaxy Fold that still hasn't come out yet, was that smartphone design has hit a limit. And he added this last, which I think is the most interesting. In five years or so, people will not even realize they are wearing screens. Mm hmm. You know, I I don't disagree with this. I think that that is true. I think it's it's very hard for you and I to, you know, kind of like get to the point where we're like, okay, this thing, this object where I I access the internet and I access my apps and all of my information comes from, that is just going to like be part of my, you know, my person. Yes, it is. And I, and, and it, it, it's, it's the same way that uh, 20 years ago, none of us could ever consider smartphones. 
we couldn't we couldn't make them up they did not exist you just yeah. well you just couldn't put that much processing power in something that you could stick in your pocket right we, so, we just yeah, weren't there yet exactly and then and then what was the interface gonna be like because remember the old compact uh windows mobile devices they weren't even phones right uh but they had full keyboards on them and some people still sure. say oh, i was for a physical keyboard but right. it was the touch screen that made it so that you could do more with these because the screen could be bigger yeah yeah so yeah I, I don't know i mean i th i think it's easy for a ceo of a very popular company who makes a lot of popular products to be like hey you know don't worry we're gonna you know we're gonna get to that next phase of life and you know everything's gonna be embedded under our skin or whatever <laughs> um but uh not that that's exactly what he said but you know it's sort of the implication right but but yeah like how does that happen yeah, I, I one thing I will say is it needs to be convenient, right? The the switch yeah. over to a touchscreen interface was huge because, you know, your options were you either had a fold out keyboard or you had a stylus, which, in in both cases are kind of inconvenient. Even the first uh, um, the the first uh, 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 Android phone had pop out keyboards, and they were pretty popular. But at some point, people were like, "Well, you know, is isn't there a, a easier less complicated way to interact with the phone and whatever comes after the smartphone needs to have just as you know it i should not maybe not i guess easy but a very straightforward method of of interfacing with it because if it's complicated if it's if it's a wearable technology and you need to have your cpu jacket in order for your you know display glasses to work you're always going to be wearing the same jacket and that might not always be convenient depending on how thick the jacket is, you know, if it's a hot or, or cold climate or, you know, for a multitude of reasons. It just needs to be effortless. Like you wake up in the morning and, and not have to think right. about it. Right. Well, and okay, so think about the conversation we had yesterday about hybrid cars needing to have more sound so they didn't like hurt mm -hmm. people, right? Like we, th there are lots of situations where you're, where the technology is ahead of us, like the humans haven't caught up to the technology yet. So we have to kind of dial back to make it work for us because that's the only thing we know. Yeah, and I think and that this is a good example of that. When you say it has to be convenient, that's just, in some ways, that's just saying uh, for the next thing to be the next thing, it has to be the next thing, right? Like it was the same, there was the same inconceivable situation with phones, right? How could we ever have a computer actually even in a laptop form? It could never be a, a powerful enough because you need bigger components to make it powerful. But we figured that out, right? Well, yeah. And if a phone was going to be a computer, well, it would have to have a better interface, right? Because you've got this, such a small form factor can never give me the interface that a laptop can, but we figured that out. So you're, I think yeah. what you're saying, Roger, is not wrong, but you're just saying, they're going to have to figure that out. And what DJ Ko seems to be saying, and also uh, what the designer uh, Kang Young Ji is saying is, we think we're going to figure it out. Uh, and and that's, that's the key when you're looking at the future is you don't know how they're going to figure it out, but I rarely say they won't because- Oh yeah, I, I'm definitely you know, not saying they won't, but I, I you know, it, these are all very broad strokes and, you know, it took a lot of tries to get to the to get the smartphone where we at right you know before well, and and look, sure. so where are we trying right yeah. we're trying on the wrist with fitbits and apple watches and we're trying on the head uh with augmented reality glasses and snapchat lenses and all kinds of uh of takes on google glass and that sort of thing so we're just waiting for that one company to say we did it we got the one that everybody's going to going to like uh, and, and everybody does it. And it actually doesn't work that way where they say we got it. It, what happens is they put out the product and everybody likes it. And then everybody looks back and goes, Oh, they figured it out, but you don't know until it yeah. gets that up. To I, I, it's going to be a smart cat. It's going to be a device that looks like a hat. And then like, if it's, if it's a baseball cap, you just flip, there's a thing that flips on for the visor for your, for a video. Uh, not everybody wants to wear a cap though. Yeah. I think it's going to be a smart bird. 
I think it's going to have to be small and unobtrusive, like maybe like sits behind the ear and can then project into your eye uh, frame of view or something like that. But well, even I glasses, that... people don't want to always wear glasses either. I wear glasses no. all the time. Look at 3D. 3D you wear TV glasses didn't... because you have to. Yeah, 3D TV didn't take off because people are like, ah, I don't want to put on those glasses. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's not convenient. It's cumbersome. Right. I mean, I think that's part of uh, the reason that the wearables um, – market has been so interesting and it's exploded right i mean there didn't used to be a wearables market now there's lots of watches and 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 variety of devices that you can wear that will work with your human body to give you data that you want but at the same time it's all you know i feel like everybody who's making all of the stuff all the all of these wearables they're kind of sitting back being like uh is it a hit? Well, you we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out, like, is this a thing that people will want? Because some people want it. Not everybody wants it, though. Smartphones, everybody's got one of those. And, Wearables, and, not so much. Yeah, and, you know, and it's very interesting because the smartphone came about because of parallel track of technology, right? It wasn't just the technology in the phone. It was a technology and data transmission over cellular networks and having the infrastructure. So you, you need these, it's almost, you know, you need a parallel path of all these things to work in order for you to have, a phone. like you could have a smartphone, you could have had the iPhone back at the late 90s, but you wouldn't have a, a, a mobile network to take advantage of it. And so people would just say, well, what's the point? Right. If if yeah. you, you needed well, and that's where the 5G yeah. comes into the situation because of the capacity, you can actually I think what we're forgetting here is you can farm things out. We're used to this is where you get stuck in like the what is we're used to. Oh, the phone has everything on it. But with the Internet of Things, a lot of the functions can be pushed out into the network, can be pushed out into sensors and other devices. And suddenly that little implantable doesn't have to do as much and becomes more viable. Look for implantables in five to 10 years. <laughs> hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Implantable stories definitely show up there <laughs> as well as others. Submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our Facebook group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's take a look at the mailbag. Let's do it. Mike wrote in about the jump and lime scooters on Uber. We talked about this yesterday, um, being part of the Uber app, the main app. Mike Mike said he's been out of the country for about a year and said after linking his Lime and Uber accounts, he recently got a Lime scooter in front of his hotel. Mike says, I'm guessing it was a secret beta and I just had no idea that I had access to it. Hmm. Using the scooters three or four times, I was struck by how dangerous they are. As somebody who bikes in traffic in D.C., Washington, D.C., I found myself carefully watching the ground, constantly worried the scooter wheel would get stuck in a sewer grate, wouldn't make it over a pothole or get stuck between cobblestones. I think I'm going to stick with bikes for the time being. I, th I think I remember hearing something about that beta. So I, I don't think it was super secret, but uh, yeah, it probably was a surprise when you did it. Yeah. Uh, man, I, I'm with you, Mike. I, I watch people on these scooters and I think, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be on that. Like they're there, but for the grace of God to go, I, uh, and <laughs> you, those people look like they have a lot more balance. Well, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Go, Ryan, go yeah. Ryan wrote in said on the discussion of safe driving, one of the things that I dislike are the lack of knobs for controlling the audio and air conditioner and heater. I can easily reach down without looking and adjust knobs without taking my eyes off the road. I occasionally drive my mother's car with sync that manages everything by touchscreen, requiring multiple screens for each activity. You need a co-pilot to turn on the air conditioning. If you could do everything by voice, that would be fine, which a lot of new cars are having, but those controls are still very rudimentary compared to, say, an Amazon Echo. Yeah. Thank I mean, you, yes. It's uh, I, I feel your pain, Ryan. <laughs> yes, we do. I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> That's why I drive a 2002 car, because it's full of knobs. <laughs> just just, just stay just say yeah. old school. Why and not? Cassette yeah. player. Yeah. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, our goal each month is to get one more patron than last month. You could be that person that puts us over the top. Become a DTNS member. Get an ad-free RSS feed. Special episodes from myself on how we do the show. Special episodes looking back on the tech news of the past and more. Sign up at patreon.com slash DTNS. We've got an email address as well. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Email us early and often. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then.
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>